And so today we want to uh, continue on with a, a series regarding truth. <clears throat> And I'd mentioned uh, a couple weeks ago we started this. <clears throat> I was realized with the uh, with the situation that we're in, partly as a world, but more specifically here in the United States, with this uh, this pandemic and all the turmoil and confusion regarding the uh, the coronavirus, the COVID nineteen. That there was a lot of uh, bad information, a lot of uh, contradictory information, and quite frankly, a lot of lies being put forth. And I realized that uh, perhaps uh, large segments of our culture lack a desire for truth. And that they're not trying to seek the truth or reach the truth, find the truth, and they're content with just putting forth lies. <clears throat> so I was, I was very uh, fascinated with that, and so we kind of started a, a series here regarding truth, and, and last time I talked about what is the truth, and I gave uh, four, uh, four just general guidelines to help us arrive at truth uh, when we're confronted with information or a statement or, or whatever it is, whether it's in the news or whether it's in, in Scripture. Um, Th these things will help us. Number one was to love the truth. Number two is to look at the source, the source of information. Number three, to look for openness and transparency. And number four, to look at the context. And so I didn't go into a lot of detail, but those were just kind of four general principles we can use to help us. And the first one perhaps is the most important, and that is to love the truth. And, and there's a passage in the second... 2 Thessalonians, I believe, chapter uh, 2, where it talks about um, the great deception. And we may, we may visit that passage uh, more in the future. There's a great deception coming upon the earth, according to prophecy. And there's going to be a mass amount of humanity that buys into that great deception. And it specifically tells us why. The Apostle Paul tells us why in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And so we see that we, as a, as a world, have a truth deficit, and there's going to be a point in time where, where people are just going to basically sell out and, and buy into a lie. And so we don't want to be caught up in that. We want to be concerned about the truth. And the, and the very first line of defense for us is to develop a love of the truth. And, and that's, that's something that we need to be proactive with because we are bombarded even with the, the contradiction we see from politics, from government, and, and from the scientific world, and, and even from the medical field and different things. We are, we are confronted regularly with contradictory information. And so it's easy, and that's okay. It, we won't sort out everything. We won't always get to the bottom of every contradiction that we're confronted with in, in this life. That's okay. But what we don't want to do is, is develop this attitude of, of carelessness, this attitude of apathy towards truth. And that's easy to do because it's easy just to get discouraged with it all and to be frustrated with all the information that's coming at us and just kind of shove it away and just develop the attitude, we really don't care. I'm just going to live in my little circle, in my little bubble, and put on cruise control through life. That's easy to do. And so I'm not saying we need to, to um, overextend ourselves in trying to get to the root of every conflict, every contradiction. To, you know, we could become easily too bogged down doing that. But neither do we want to develop apathy towards the truth. We should have a love of the truth. Secondly, look at the source. And, and the Bible lays out a principle. Um, God details it several times throughout Scripture about the, at the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word will be established. God uses that principle in, in, in sharing truth with us. The word, the word of God in the Bible, the, the books of the Bible written by different men, 
correspond. There is a relationship. There is a connection where we can establish the, the, and verify the truthfulness of it. And also, the truth of God from a moral standpoint, God's moral truth resonates within us. That is a witness to the truth. And then we have God the, the Son and God the Holy Spirit all bearing witness to the truth of God's written Word. <clears throat> and so, th there's an, even as we look around us, you know, we can look at the source of the information being given us, and sometimes we realize by investigating the source that it is not a trustworthy source. So that can, that can lead us to um, maybe dismiss some of the information that they're giving us. And then the third point, looking for openness and transparency. Uh, that also is important because with, with, if someone is trying to impart truth, they will be open and transparent. What happens with a lie is there are things hidden. There are secret things. They, they want to withhold information or to take statements out of context and push it to put a new spin a new context on it to give it a new meaning. And so there is, there is the deception, the, the, the uh, secrecy, the hiddenness, the, the lack of transparency, the, the issue of holding back information. That should cause us to be suspicious, to be, be concerned about the information coming from that source. <clears throat> so we can look for openness and transparency. And then the fourth is to look at the context. Look at the context of what is being spoken. And that makes a big difference because I can make a statement and you take someone across the world and I, I didn't really come up with a, a specific example. But you can take someone across the world in a third world country in Africa that can make the same statement and it would maybe be perceived totally different because of their context. You know, it might have to have something to do with work or, or uh, money or food or whatever. The context I'm dealing with here in America is entirely different than some third world countries. And so when, when, uh, when you look at the source of information or a specific statement, and that's what I'm thinking of more, more importantly, a specific statement, there is always a context in which that statement is made. We see that being exposed in the media today. I've seen it just wholesale in the last couple months where someone will make a statement within a certain context and the media will spin that to their own liking because they ignore the context, create their own context, but yet they capitalize on the statement. It's not that the statement is a lie, but the context has been changed. And so context is very important. So that's really what we want to look at um, today and, and yet in the future with some more lessons is realizing how important context is because this issue of context is important not only in the in the world in which we live but that is the perhaps number one issue in studying the word of god the bible the very word that we find so much confusion about today the the challenge is to study it in the proper context <clears throat> And I want, to, I want to point that out because today we want to look at the issue of the end of the world. And there are those who feel like that, um, and we'll look at some verses that would, would lend themselves to believe that we are in the end times. We are at the end of the world. <clears throat> and so that is a, a, a pertinent issue. And so we want to look at that topic, maybe, maybe this and, and perhaps a future lesson, to understand the reason why there are so many different views of the end of the world is because of the issue of context. It's not because we're disagreeing about what specific statements are in the Bible. It's because what is the context around those statements that cause confusion. <clears throat> I got this email a couple uh, uh, weeks ago that caught my attention. And it says, the rapture cult is a centuries-old fraud designed to deceive the Christians. Do you see that? They're immediately saying that if you believe in a pre-tribulational rapture, that's where this is heading, you're part of a cult that is, is just a modern deception. 
It goes on to say, and I'm not reading the whole thing, but global pestilence, financial meltdown, weather disasters, nations prepping for war, famine, and more. Doesn't that sound tribulational? The last days are here. And since you brought, you bought into the rapture lie, you're going to be caught by surprise. And see, that's not, that's not necessarily uncommon thinking today <clears throat> that if you believe in a rapture of the church before the tribulation, you are deceived. <clears throat> And well, that's, that can be a big deal because the Bible talks a lot about the end of the world and some of the things that are going to happen at the end of the world are, are things that uh, if we're going to be expecting to live through that time, we want to be prepared and aware of it because it's pretty serious. Um, you can turn to Matthew 24. We'll look at a couple of verses. <clears throat> and I want to show you that when we talk about the end of the world, the, the dispute, the differing of opinions and views are not because of the verses. The verses are there, and the verses mean what they say, and it's clear on what they say. Matthew 24, and we'll look at verse 3. Um, well, verse 1. We'll just start in verse 1. Matthew 24, 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and His disciples came to Him for to show Him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and, and the end of the world? Notice that's the question that starts into the dialogue of the whole next two chapters of Matthew. Jesus will go into a very long, detailed sermon or teaching session to His disciples about the signs of His coming and the end of the world. Verse 4 says, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. So first of all, before He goes into any detail, He warns them about deception. So obviously that's an important the important point. But the verse 7 is really what I'm after. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences or diseases and earthquakes in diverse places. And so that is a common verse when people see all the calamities of the world going on around us, whether it's war, uh, famine, disease, uh, whatever it is, they look to a verse like that and they think, we are seeing that. Aren't we living in that time now? And we can turn over to Luke chapter 21, which is a parallel account of the same, um, the same teaching that Jesus is giving His disciples. And in Luke 21, <clears throat> verse 25 and 26, it says, And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth, distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Notice in that verse, notice distress of nations. So more than just war, distress of nations. <clears throat> verse 26, men's hearts failing them for fear. Doesn't that sound familiar? And for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And so people will look at some of the, the bad things that's happened here on earth, and they'll look at verses like this, and they will conclude that, hey, this, we're seeing the thing play out. This is the end of the world. <clears throat> and so many times uh, throughout history even, and specifically right now, once again, the thinking is renewed that we are in the last days. Some even saying we are in the tribulation at this point. <clears throat> and there's a lot more verses we could go to. Um, 
that people would use to make that claim. And what's fascinating to me is there have been countless predictions in the past 2,000 years about the end of the world, even with date setting. Setting a date and saying this will mark the end of the world. And sometimes they'll include the return of Christ in that. Sometimes they just mean that it's, it's all the signs of prophecy given that are going to bring about the conclusion of the end of the world. And there have been, I, I was surprised, I, I went ahead and did a search on Wikipedia. You can find a list of famous or well-known people who have made end-of-the-world predictions. And it's quite fascinating. Martin Luther is on that list. He made a specific date back in the 1500s of, of when the world would end. Uh, Charles Russell, who began the uh, Watchtower uh, Society and uh, eventually called Jehovah's Witness, he made multiple predictions of the end of the world through the late 1800s, and, uh, and none of it came to pass. Uh, Pat Robertson has made uh, predictions. Harold Camping, more recently, has made multiple predictions of the end of the world. And when it doesn't come to pass, he'll change the date. But he's, he's been involved even on, on television and things um, even more recently. I think as, as early as either 2011 or 2013, he was still making that prediction. Nostradamus. Now, I think he, in which he lived many hundreds of years ago, but he predicted the world would end in the late 1900s. I'm not sure if it was 1997 or when it was. But just from his calculations of the of the stars or the solar system or something, um, he believed it would end before two th the year 2000. And then Y2K came, and we have uh, Jerry Falwell and um, the, the authors of the Left Behind series, um, Jerry Jenkins and Tim LaHaye. They were predicting that the world would end at the turn of the millennium, the year 2000. And then even more recently, in 2012, was the end of the Mayan calendar. And that was kind of a big deal for a while because these Mayans were astrologers and they understood you know, things that a lot of people don't understand today and their calendar ended in 2012. And so a lot of people were picking up that that was an indication that that would be the end of the world. <clears throat> All those people, and I've only listed just a small sampling of the many people who have made that prediction. They've all been wrong. Every one of them. When it came to determining the end of the world and looking for the signs of the times, they were all wrong. Why is that? Why were they wrong? And even when we think about them putting forth false information, <clears throat> you know, people do that and, and um, they mislead their audiences with things that aren't true, some are doing it intentionally and some in ignorance. And it is important to make that distinction. <clears throat> and if we think about why would someone do that intentionally? Well, money, fame, and power. When you look at uh, some of the TV ministries going on today, there is a lot of money involved in that, and fame and power as well, but any one of those three or a combination of those three things will definitely have an impact on people and can subtly change them to the point where they no longer care about the truth and they're concerned about the money, the, the fame, and the power. <clears throat> and so they're willing to tell people lies if it enhances their audience, if it enhances their money coming in or their power and control over people. And so that is a problem and something to be concerned about. But yet there are many uh, preachers and pastors and Bible scholars in the past and yet today, and some on that list I read, who were well-intentioned. They had a love for the truth. They were concerned about the truth, and yet they were wrong about the end of the world. And it wasn't because they weren't reading their Bible. It wasn't because they were getting information outside the Bible. Such as Jerry Falwell and uh, uh, Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins and um, Martin Luther 
and some of those people, they were studying the Bible intently, trying to determine the end of the world. And the Bible talks about the signs. Jesus gave the signs, and you go to the Old Testament, and there's a lot more to it than what He just gave. Gave the signs of His coming and the signs of the end of the world. And so people are going to the source, the correct source, to try to find that answer. But why were they wrong? What is the one thing that they were missing? There was one big mistake that all these Bible end-of-the-world predictors were making. <clears throat> and maybe if you uh, have already connected how I started out this lesson, you've already got it figured out. They failed to properly understand the context of those prophecies. That was the issue. The prophecies are true. The verses mean what they say. The verses are real. The verses are clear. The verses aren't that hard to understand. But there is a context around those verses that is very important. And so many people are taking those verses and wrongly applying it to their lives because they've ignored the overall context in which it was spoken. And that's important because I, uh, I'm reminded of a... I, the first time I heard this, I believe, was on the radio, Christian radio. And I was surprised because you don't normally hear this kind of honest, truthful, even dispensational statement on Christian radio. But they said we should, we should not be looking for the signs of the times because we are not living in the times of the signs. Now pay attention closely. We should not be looking for the signs of the times because we are not living in the times of the signs. In other words, there is a specific context in which Jesus talked about these times of the signs. And that is a scriptural phrase. <clears throat> the times of the signs. And there is a specific context in which He talked about those things. And, and he was giving it to a specific audience for a specific purpose under a specific context, and we are not living in that context. We are not living in that time. That's what all these Bible predictors have gotten wrong. It's not that they were ill-intentioned. <clears throat> it's not that they were not good Bible scholars, but they failed to look at the overall context. Now look at 1 Corinthians or 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. <clears throat> Jesus talked about the times of the signs. And he mentions that uh, he talks about signs a lot. Just that chapter 24 of Matthew that we looked at, he talked about the signs of the coming. And earlier in, in chapter 16, he specifically uses the phrase um, signs of the times. <clears throat> but here in chapter, uh, chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians, Paul is writing to the Thessalonians, members of the body of Christ, and he says, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, Ye have no need that I write unto you. <clears throat> now, that, and, and I think we'll come back and look at this uh, passage in a little bit, but that is a pretty bold statement. Because where the disciples asked Jesus about the signs, and they were confused about the end of the world, Jesus gave them a lot more information about the signs. He enhanced their understanding. He took a lot of time to lay it all out for him and to explain everything. And so you can take Matthew 24 and go back in prophecy in the Old Testament and tie things in, especially with Daniel and, and some of the others as well, and see how it all works together. Jesus was enhancing their understanding of the times of the signs, or, or the times and the seasons and the signs of the times. But here Paul says, but of the times and the seasons you have no need that I write unto you. Why does he say that? Because 
we understand now that Paul was talking in a different context. He was dealing with a people in a different time. And so we, we see this, this issue of the times and seasons and signs of the times, we now see in a different light because we're not in the same context. So we want to look at that. Um, <clears throat> we are not just picking and choosing verses when we say that. <clears throat> and for me to, and here's one thing I want to be clear about, for me to say, to stand up here, even looking at this uh, COVID-19, and to say emphatically, we are not living in the end of the world. <clears throat> we are not living in the end of the world as described in Matthew 24. For me to emphatically say that is not arrogant. And I'm not saying that because I feel like I'm smarter than all these other people. I don't feel like I'm smarter than Martin Luther. I am not smarter than, than Jerry, Jen uh, Jerry Jenkins or um, Jerry Falwell or many of those people. <clears throat> The only difference is, I have learned the importance of context. And, and so when you understand the overall context, that's what allows you to rightly apply specific verses to today's experience, to your life. But see, if you don't, if you miss the overall context, you will wrongly apply that. <clears throat> And so we are plagued with a problem as, as humans with what some people call tunnel vision. And maybe you've heard about that. Tunnel vision is when it's almost like you're looking in a tunnel and you can't see everything going on around. All you see is what is straight in front of you. It's like you've got blinders on. And so we call that tunnel vision. And we are plagued with that. We see that in the, in the society in which we live. Um, we, we all deal with that to some extent or another. But just think about what's going on right now with this um, uh, COVID-19 situation. Immediately, as this became a big deal, people was like, we, we've got to shut everything down. We've got to stay home. We're concerned about this virus. We're concerned about the death toll. We have got to stay home. Everybody has to isolate and stay home. And right away, I, 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 I noticed it right away that we were having tunnel vision. We were concerned about one thing and we failed to look at the big picture because we need to look at, okay, what do we, we don't even know what, the, at that point, we didn't know what the death toll would be of COVID-19. But instead of looking at the projection of the death toll of COVID-19 and to look at all the fallout and perhaps death toll of, of isolation of shutting down the economy and, and weighing the two options and say, how do we balance this? Everybody just went wholesale. They just saw the one thing. They saw death from COVID-19. And so everything was focused on escaping death of COVID-19, not realizing that maybe we were going to plunge ourselves into further destruction because of the fallout from that, because we weren't looking at the big context. We had tunnel vision as a society. And so then, then um, we even talked about essential versus non-essential. And now it's become a point where people are tunnel vision again. We've got governors who are, are just, it seems like going on an authority um, uh, rant, so to speak. So they, they can just arbitrarily choose who's essential and who's non-essential. They have, they've, they've missed the context again. They got sucked in to this tunnel vision of determining what's essential and what's non-essential to try to get more people to stay home instead of looking at what the, the, the main issue, the overarching context to begin with is what is safe and what's not safe. And so many of them are missing the point. You know, they, there, there's, a, there's a governor north of here that has stated that being out in a boat is non-essential, so you can't do it. But she's ignored the fact that maybe it's entirely safe. You can't plant seeds in your garden because that's non-essential. But ignoring the fact that that may be entirely safe. 
And so see, it's a tunnel vision. They get sidetracked. They, they, stay, they fail to step back, try to gain a better understanding of the context and see everything going on, and they just get sucked into one thing. So now, even more recently, it's the mask. Got to wear a mask. And it's just everybody's just you know, focused in. Some states, it's, it's mandatory. You have to wear a mask. But we're not seeing statistics on how much does a mask help, how much does it hurt, because it does hurt, harm some people, and what's the you know what's the the best outcome here? It's just wear the mask, wear the mask, tunnel vision, and so that is a problem. And it's also a problem in studying the Bible. People look at a verse and they see the verse, and the verse talks about war and famine and pestilence, and they look at the verse and they look at the verse and they look around us and it's happening. We're in the end of the world. They fail to step back, look at the context. <clears throat> and so if we can train ourselves to do that, even as we train ourselves to do that in Bible study, it helps equip us to do the same thing. We need to develop that, that pattern of thinking, that habit of trying to gain the context, trying to understand the big picture of what is going on. And that will help us to understand the little details and, and apply them the right way. So that's what we want to think about in Bible study is understanding the context. And Miles Coverdale, this is a kind of a famous quote of his. Miles Coverdale lived back in the, I believe, 1500s and was the first one to translate a Bible into the English language. And he wrote, It shall greatly help thee to understand the Scriptures if thou mark not only what was spoken or written, but of whom and to whom, with what words, at what time, where, to what intent, with what circumstances, considering what goeth before and what followeth after. That whole description he gave out was to try to encourage people to build the context. Don't just pay attention to what was spoken or written. Build the context. Understand what was going before it and after it, to whom it was given, by whom it was spoken, for what intent, for what purpose. And so understanding all those things will help you correctly um, interpret or identify and apply the specific verse or statement. <clears throat> and so that's really where we want to be today, and we'll turn to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. <clears throat> and as we think about studying the Bible, to be dispensational in our Bible study is to understand the context. That's essentially what dispensationalism is. It's realizing that there are different subcontexts there is an overarching context in the Bible, and there are different subcontexts in the Bible that all work together. And so if we understand that, that leads us toward dispensational Bible study. <clears throat> and so we can look at this uh, in Ephesians chapter 3, and we're really kind of breaking in, because in chapter 2, he's already talked about the difference, the separation that existed in time past between Jew and Gentile. And now they've been made one because there is something new. There's a new context going on with what's, what Paul is dealing with in the body of Christ. And so in verse 1 of chapter 3, Ephesians 3, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. Now, that's an important statement because if we understand the context, if we've already studied the Bible, you know, starting from Revelations and moving forward, we realize all Scripture was given by a Jew to the Jews. And it was about the Jews. Sometimes the Gentiles would play into that in a small way, like Nebuchadnezzar, and as the Jews were taken over or carried away captive by the Gentiles. But by and large, it was not randomly about the Gentile world. It was all about Israel. And here Paul is making a statement that should catch everyone's attention he says he's the prisoner 
of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. And he talks about in Romans chapter 11 about being the apostle of the Gentiles. That's the first time in the Bible that you will ever see that kind of thing. You don't see that before the Apostle Paul. <clears throat> because the Gentiles were always secondary. Verse 2, If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you word. So here, Paul is talking about a dispensation. And some people will come along and argue, well, he just means that he's dispensing. So he's dispensing grace, but there's... There's uh, people in the past that have dispensed grace. Old Testament, you know, that God was dispensing grace to Noah. And, and so it doesn't really mean anything. They've stripped this passage of what it means when they say that. Paul explains what he means. of a dis He doesn't mean just dispensing grace. He means we are living in a time now, a time that was unforetold, unprophesied, and it is a time of grace because... In, in contrast to the wrath and the judgment of the world that was coming. That's the context here we're going to find with this dispensation of grace. It's something given exclusively to Paul for today. As God is not dealing with the Jews as a, or the Israel as a covenant nation today, He is dealing with Jew and Gentile alike as members of the body of Christ. <clears throat> So anyway, verse 3, he says, How by, that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, that's something that has been kept secret, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So he defines the dispensation of grace as a revelation of the mystery, which was revealed to him, it was not known prior to Him. The Lord Jesus Christ gave it to Him for us Gentiles. We learn about it through the Apostle Paul. <clears throat> Verse 6, That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of His promise in Christ by the Gospel. Now, some people will again come along and look at that, that little verse right there and say, well, see, we're spiritual Israel because God was dealing with Israel right here. Uh, they didn't perform the way He wanted them to. And so now He's allowed Gentiles to come up here and join in with Israel. And so now we're spiritual Israel because we're all part of one body. But they've missed the context again because He's already dealt with the greater context here in Ephesians. He's already dealt with chapter 2 that it was not Gentile blending with Jews. That was prophesied. Gentiles could become proselytes at any time and be a part of the people of God throughout Israel's history. What Paul is talking about now, and he laid out in chapter 2, is he's made one new man. So he's set aside Israel. The Gentiles are already set aside. So now, instead of Gentiles joining Israel, he's, he's moved over, started something entirely new. It's a new creature. It's the one new man. Made up of Jew or Gentile. That's what's happening today. That's the context for today. Verse 7. <clears throat> whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God, given unto me by the effectual working of His power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. The reason they're unsearchable is because he, it, it's the same Lord Jesus Christ. It's the same death, burial, and resurrection. But Paul now has more information about what all that accomplished that is unsearchable. You cannot go back into the Old Testament. You can't go to the four Gospels to find out all the unsearchable riches that Paul laid out. It was new revelation. That's what's different. Verse 9, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God. It was not hid in the Old Testament. It was not hid in the Law and the Prophets or the Psalms. It wasn't hidden in the four Gospels. It was hid in God until He revealed it through the Apostle Paul, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be, known by, might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. And so, to be dispensational in our Bible study means we're looking at a bigger context. <clears throat> in fact, we could turn back to uh, Ephesians chapter 2, 
and we're going to see some, some words that help us in this context, this, this dispensational context to understand the Word of God. <clears throat> uh, look at verse 11. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past, Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh, made by hands. Notice that word, time past. Because that is a time element there. And Paul is talking about what the Gentiles look like in time past. Verse 12, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Because God was dealing with Israel. The Gentiles had rebelled. And so ever since the Tower of Babel, God had focused His attention on Abram, changed his name to Abraham, developed a nation from him. The chosen nation gave them covenants and promises, and God was dealing with Israel from that point forward. And Gentiles were excluded. If Gentiles wanted to be saved, it wasn't because God was actively out there trying to deal with the Gentiles. God was actively manifesting Himself to the world through Israel, and if Gentiles wanted to be saved, they needed to come to Israel. <clears throat> But look at the next verse, 13. Verse 13. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. But now. Another time word. So you have time past, but he said, but now there's something different going on. And Paul uses that term many times in his, in his uh, uh, writings. But now. Because he wants us to be attracted to that phrase to the point where we realize that what he is saying is different than what was in time past. <clears throat> There's a distinction. Well, if we jump back into verse 7, we'll see another time uh, word or phrase. Verse 7, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. So right here in this short passage, we have time past, but now ages to come. Those are time words. They help enhance our context, our understanding of the context of what is going on. And so that's, that's really all that this chart is laying out. This chart behind me is providing a context in, in, in graph or picture form of the Bible. That's all it is. There's not a lot of detail here. You find the detail here. But if you want to properly apply the detail of the Bible it greatly helps you to understand the overall context. So that's what this, this chart is designed for, to get the big picture. So we've got the time past that we just read about. We've got the but now, and we've got the ages to come. So those are three important distinctions to help us understand the context. So in time past, God was dealing with Israel. Gentiles were afar off. They were down here. So God gave Abram, He called him out, made a nation out of him. And Israel was given a law. They were near to God. If you, if you imagine God being up here, Israel was near unto God. The Gentiles were far off from God. God dealt with Israel. Jesus came on the earth to fulfill all that the law and prophets had spoken of Him. He was still dealing with Israel. He exclusively says that. In the early part of Acts, Peter and Stephen, they are addressing Israel. But because of Israel's fall and their rebellion, which was prophesied, by the way, that was prophesied. God was going to pour out His wrath. Seven years of tribulation. So we could even and shut that. According to prophecy, they didn't see the but now. They did not see the current dispensation of grace that we live in. All they saw was this, Israel's rejection, the wrath of God coming upon them and the world, called it seven years of tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble. And then Christ would come. Those would be the signs of the end of the world in that time period. So the signs of the times are in the time of the tribulation. That was all prophesied. 
And so then Christ, after that time, would come back to earth, set up His kingdom, and there would be a thousand year reign of Christ on earth. What the Apostle Paul reveals is this dispensation of grace, the but now. And it is made, it's the body of Christ. It's made up of Jew or Gentile because God has, has withdrawn, so to speak, or Israel has fallen. They have become no different than the Gentiles today. There is no advantage today to being a Jew. But in time past, there was. In ages to come, there will be. Today, there is no advantage. Understanding that context makes a world of difference in our Bible study. A world of difference. Because you can, and I have witnessed this, and I'm sure some of you have as well, you can take the most scholarly men, men who are extremely intelligent, and they, they, they are intelligent, they sound intelligent, they speak intelligently, and they know this Bible front to back. They can, they can quote the verses. They can do word studies. They understand the words. They understand the Greek and the Hebrew. And they are extremely smart. And yet I contend that the church, the, the church as a whole has kind of bought into the idea that, that we need those kind of people up in the front teaching people. And you're really not qualified unless you've been to seminary, unless you've, you've went through the proper channels of gaining all the knowledge and information and wisdom and training to equip you to teach the Word of God. And I believe that's a lie. And that's why I'm standing up here in front of you. Because I am not standing here as one who has mastered the Bible. I have not mastered uh, the English language, let alone Greek or Hebrew. And I'm not going to claim to master it. And I'm not going to claim to know uh, every verse in the Bible and what it means. And I'm not going to claim to be smarter than anyone else out there. What I do claim to know is to, to know the key, to hold the key, to understand, as, as Don would say, this passage in Ephesians 3 is the key to rightly understanding the Bible. And if you have that key, it unlocks so much of our understanding. So that we can go to the Bible, we can look at the context, correctly identify whether it was spoken to Israel, for Israel, under a covenant, or to us, for us, in the dispensation of grace. And it makes all the difference. The Bible is no longer this confusing book. It's no longer this devotional book where we just pick and choose verses that kind of feel good and warm our hearts. And as, as Barry shared with me uh, two weeks ago, gobbledygook. That's what it is to a lot of people. This book is just full of gobbledygook. It's just this. It's, Bible study is difficult. People just they get bogged down in the confusion of it because they're... Not, they haven't learned to look at the overall context. And that is so important because that, that makes it, just like I think God desires, that makes this book manageable, digestible, and to a large degree understandable by anyone, by you and I. Without seminary, without all those years of higher education. <clears throat> And so it's extremely important. We can look at 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2, and there's a familiar verse here. But it really, we, we quote 2 Timothy 2.15 pretty often. And it's an important verse, but if we just look at the next few verses, we see why, a, a perfect example of why this is important. In 2 Timothy 2.15, it says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so this whole thing, this whole chart of providing the context of the Bible is labeled as rightly dividing the word of truth because we need to understand that we need to divide time past from but now and divide that from the ages to come. 
Okay, well that's important, but look at what he says. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Now, that's kind of an interesting uh, study just to look at those the profane and vain babblings have, have to do with the Word of God. Profane is, is taking something that belongs to God and twisting it for a, the wrong purpose. That's to profane it. In the Old Testament, Israel was warned against profaning the instruments of the temple because it was taking the instruments of the temple, using it for idol worship or for things that God did not intend. The same thing happens with the Word of God. When we take the Word of God, we isolate a passage, we pull it out of context, we apply it to the wrong people, warn people about the, the wrath of God or the, the tribulation period or the mark of the beast, we are profaning the Word of God. And it's vain babblings. For it says, they will increase unto more ungodliness. Verse 17, And their word will eat at death a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. Notice verse 18, Who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. You see how he just gave us an example of why it's important to rightly divide the word of truth. Because actually, if you study the, the Bible, there are... Uh, perhaps four different resurrections mentioned. There is a resurrection that took place with Christ. And remember, if you go back and read that account, it was not just Christ. It says many in the graves. It says many of the graves were, were opened up and the saints walked the earth that had been dead. So when Christ resurrected, there were many who were resurrected with Him. But that is one resurrection. And then there's another resurrection that the Apostle Paul talks about that's when we call it the rapture, and that's when this dispensation of grace comes to a close, and we're to look for the Lord in the air. That is a resurrection. Well, and then we are also confronted with the, the resurrection in prophecy when Christ comes to set up his kingdom on earth. All these Old Testament saints Abraham, David, even Adam, Noah they will be resurrected to go through that promised kingdom on earth. And so there's a resurrection at the, at the beginning of this kingdom. And then there's also a resurrection. Uh, Jesus mentioned it, warned of it, in uh, John chapter 12, I believe. And, uh, and Revelation chapter 20 talks about it. It's a, revelation, or a, a resurrection of the unjust at the great white throne judgment. So right there is four resurrections. So you see how it's important to rightly divide the word of truth, because here Paul was confronted with people who were teaching that the resurrection was past already. Well, the next resurrection that we're dealing with is the resurrection of the body of Christ, the rapture. And so if that is past already, and the, he, these two leaders here in the church had convinced people they had missed it, that means that they were not saved and it's, oh, it was overthrowing their faith. They were bothered by that because they had been told by the Apostle Paul to look for the Lord's return and that they would be resurrected and they would all meet the Lord. And here there would come along people who say, no, you missed it. We're actually now in the tribulation period. We're actually now moving on to the end of the world. And it overthrew their faith. <clears throat> and so it's importantly, important to rightly divide the word of truth. <clears throat> so what do we learn from the Apostle Paul about the end of the world and the tribulation? He has some things. So that was laid out in detail in prophecy. And the Apostle Paul comes along and says, I've been given a revelation of the mystery. We are no longer living in that dispensation. We are in the dispensation of the grace of God, which was kept secret. It was unfortold. It was hid in God. And so the things happening today are not the end of the world. It's not the tribulation. It's not all those things that were prophesied that would happen to Israel. But Paul has, does have to deal with that because there is confusion regarding that. And we find uh, an example of that in uh, 1 Thessalonians. We'll look there first. <clears throat> 1 
1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. <clears throat> For we believe that Jesus, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with Him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord shall descend, Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So he's saying, we're, we're going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. But he said, we're, we in no way hinder those who have already died in Christ. All members of the body of Christ are going to meet Him. And so he, he explains, he said, he said, he's telling the Thessalonians, he said, just because... People have died and this dispensation hasn't ended yet. The Lord hasn't returned and called us all home. Doesn't mean that they're not going to participate in what's been promised us in the dispensation of grace as far as our future eternal position in heaven. He said that is not taken away just because they die. In fact, they are going to rise first, he says. Those who have died in the Lord will rise first and we're not going to hinder that just because we're alive. <clears throat> Um, verse 17, Then we, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, those who have rose from the dead, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So that's going, supposed to be a source of comfort. The words that he has just laid out is supposed to be a source of comfort. Look at verse 1 of chapter 5. But of the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. That's the verse we just read. But notice the pronouns as we go through this. Paul's going to talk about this times and seasons to try to clarify or to uh, give them a better understanding. He says, of the times and seasons, ye have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. So the day of the Lord is this prophetic end of the world. He's telling them, you don't need for me to write unto you of the times and seasons because you know that that's out here coming as a thief in the night. Verse 3, for when they, in other words, he's changed now. He's not talking to you as Thessalonians. When you shall say peace and safety, it's they, that group of people. When that group of people say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, you Thessalonians, you in the body of Christ, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all children of the light and children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. And all you have to do is look at different... Paul explains this in further in uh, Romans chapter 13. And you go back in prophecy and you realize this day of the Lord is called darkness. This whole time of, of seven-year tribulation is called, a, is called a time of clouds and thick darkness. A time of desolation. A time of destruction. Paul says you are not part of that. You are children of light. You're not going to live through that time period because of this catching away to meet the Lord in the air. <clears throat> uh, we could continue on. Verse 6, Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we live in the dispensation of grace. That's why it's called the dispensation of grace because this time of wrath was ready to come before the Lord Jesus Christ saved Saul of Tarsus and gave him the information regarding this dispensation of grace. So now in grace, we have not been appointed to this time of wrath. We have been appointed to salvation to meet the Lord in the air 
before this time of wrath takes place. So that's kind of what he's laying out here. God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. Salvation from that wrath. <clears throat> and I believe that's why it's called, like in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 2, that's why Paul calls it the dispensation of grace. It's not because there was not grace prior to the Apostle Paul. It's not because Old Testament saints did not receive grace. They did. So we are receiving grace today, but it's not that they were under only law, only works, you know, no grace, and we are. It's that our whole dispensation was based on the grace of God so that we are going to be delivered from God's wrath. Whereas Israel was promised God's wrath if they disobeyed, which they continually did. And so the whole Gentile uh, world and the Jews, the, the nation of Israel, in that time will experience the wrath of God. <clears throat> but Paul says that we are not. We are in dispensation of grace. If we look over to Titus chapter 2, uh, I think we're about ready to wrap it up here, but Titus chapter 2, I want to look at about three different verses here or passages. <clears throat> now, as we read these, just think about the fact. Look at the comparison if you're familiar at all with Matthew chapter 24 and 25, um, any of the old uh, prophecies regarding the end of the world, when the disciples come to Christ and ask Him about the signs of His coming and the signs of the end of the world, think about all the details He gives them, all the warnings He gives them, the instruction to be not deceived. And He goes to great lengths to enhance their understanding of, of what they're to be looking for. Look for this, look for this, but that doesn't mean the end is yet. And then look for this and this, and then there's going to be great tribulation, and look for this and this. And then there's going to be a sign from heaven that lies lightning, and the Lord shall return. The Son of Man shall return. He systematically lays it all out so there's no confusion. That's in contrast to what the Apostle Paul teaches us. And that's easy to see if we understand the Apostle Paul is dealing with a different context. We're not Israel. We're living in dispensation of grace. We're not appointed unto wrath. We're looking for the, the, the catching up. So look at what Paul says. He doesn't talk about all these signs. He, the only time he does really in detail is there what we read in, in Thessalonians, where he says, you don't need that I write unto you of the times and seasons. But when he talks about the end of our existence here on earth, look what he says. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus told them to look for signs, and He gave them more signs. Paul says, he doesn't say look for signs. Nowhere does he say look for these signs. He says look for the appearing. That's what all those Bible predict the end of the world Bible predictors got wrong. They were looking for signs. And the signs are detailed in the Bible. But we're not living in that context. We are not to look for signs. We are to look for the appearing. It's just going to happen one day. <clears throat> and look over to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. And, and by the way, Paul does warn about in the latter days... So as we get towards the end of this dispensation of grace, even though we have no idea what, when that is, he warns of certain traits that are going to get worse and worse among men. But he doesn't give us signs to look for. You see, there's a difference. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 says, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, 
the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it might be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. So again, that's consistent. We can, we can look over at Colossians chapter 3. Paul is continually confronting his audience with look for the Lord. Look for his glorious appearing. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. By the way, we're risen with Christ because we have been identified already by believing the gospel. We are identified with Christ's resurrection. So we are already in God's reckoning, seated in heavenly places. So we are risen with Christ. He says, Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above and not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with Him in glory. So that's what we're looking for. The appearing of Christ. We're not looking for the signs. We don't, we don't live in the time of the signs. So it's, it's futile. We can study it, and I think it's good to, to look at the, the signs of the times and to look at prophecy and to have a good grasp of what's going on there. That is good. That, that benefits us in our overall understanding of the Bible, and specifically it benefits us to help other people as they struggle with that. But the number one issue is to realize, and the number one issue that all Bible predictions of the end of the world have gotten wrong, is they failed to recognize we are not living in the time of the signs. <clears throat> That's why the, the, we've got to look at the context, and you've maybe heard of this. Context is king. When we study the Word of God, and we go to different uh, passages, different verses, different words. Context is king. In other words, that rules over everything. That's the most important thing. That's what Miles uh, uh, Coverdale was trying to get across. Look at the context. The next thing, major event that we are to look for, you and I as members of the body of Christ, the next major event according to the Bible that we are to look for is the great and glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not the signs. So anyway, Lord willing, we will take up um, the issue of, of truth and perhaps deal more with the end of the world. Um, I kind of laid out more detail about how we're to look at it this time. And maybe just so that we're uh, more familiar with it, we'll look at how Israel would look at it, the context of Israel's end of the world uh, in the future. So with that, if there's any uh, question or comment, we'll feel free. <clears throat> well, I really appreciate it. I really appreciate it. Um, the, the fact that you pointed out the pronouns there, <clears throat> in 1 Thessalonians um, 5, the ye versus they. And I guess right. never focused on that before, and it makes it so much clearer. Right. So. Yeah, because, um, and thank you for bringing that up, but Paul uses prophecy many times. He'll go to Old Testament, because there's so many principles that we need to learn from all the Bible, but he doesn't say, that we are fulfilling prophecy. You look how he uses it, and like in Romans and, and different places, he will quote, and even in 1 Corinthians, he will quote Old Testament passages to get the principle out of it so that we can have a, a, better, um, a better understanding or a better way to honor God today. To show that kind, con but, but he doesn't say we're fulfilling prophecy. When you look at Matthew, Jesus was continually filling, fulfilling prophecy. Matthew even states it. Um, and so that's important. So that's what the times and the seasons when he deals with prophecy specifically here, he's saying you don't need I write it unto you because you're not living in that context. And so when it comes to fulfillment of prophecy, it's all about Israel and their their time period, time past or ages to come. <clears throat> but yeah, good point. Anything else? 
we've sort of talked about this before, but that the the tool that you uh, referenced and that we have on the, the board behind us um, is so critical to the overall understanding and the way that you walk through the time pass button, now ages to come, those time elements assist us in understanding that overall view. And in the, like you talked about and what Barry said, it's easy to get bogged down in the minutia of the detail that you read and, right. and pinpoint. And, and I think that's what we're trying to work through when we um, are trying to help other people with truth, shedding that light. Um, and even my own um, personal history is, and the struggle of understanding the Bible was getting caught in that. Um, reading something and trying to apply that portion of scripture to my life. And I think yeah. a lot of Christianity tr does that. And that's what devotions are for um, with that mindset. And, and, and their intent is, I think, correct. That, right. You know, we want to apply God's word to our lives. Right. But in the sense... We're doing it in the wrong context. Yeah. And the way that Miles Coverdale said that many centuries ago and the way that it's still applicable today, we need to understand that overall and to utilize the truth of um, and the, the tool that we have there to see the overall picture where we fit into that is so critical to us understanding scripture, yep. how to apply it to us and then to take it to others. And share it with others because if we just speak the truth of the bible but in the wrong context we further satan's work in a way because right. he's the author of confusion yeah and all he needs to do is take truth and add something to it or take something away from it right and he's confused yep the he's confused us he's confused <clears throat> humanity yeah and so that's why it's so um such a big task for us i think to recognize we have to rightly divide the word of truth and we have to um, use scripture in the right way to not uh, perilously take it to somebody else. Yeah. And so I, I do appreciate you going through this truth series and, and this end of the world today, you know, was so um, uh, beneficial, I guess, for the times that we're in. Right. You know, and, and helping us recognize we're not in the sign of, or they're not in the time of the signs yeah um because like you mentioned that's what people are looking for right yeah yeah thank you yeah that's exactly right i mean it's it's so and i was there uh, a number of years ago i was focused in on the uh, so, you know this prophecy stuff the signs of the times looking at those verses and i really wanted to understand them and see apply it to what was going on around us and boy, it just, it took some time, but once I understood the overall context, those verses are true, but it's not the whole truth. There is more, more to the story. When I realized I wasn't in that time period, made the Bible clear up a lot. Quit worrying about the mark of the beast. You know, I mean, <laughs> that's a big deal to a lot of people. <clears throat> okay, anything else? If not, let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful that we can fellowship together in your word. And, and Father, we do rejoice in the things of Christ that we have in this dispensation of grace in the body of Christ. Um, Father, that we have been delivered from that appointed time of wrath to come. And so, Father, we rejoice in that. But not only that, we rejoice in salvation through the cross of Christ, that we are at peace with you. That during this time, <clears throat> you have reconciled the world unto yourself. So help us, Father, in, in wisdom and, and in understanding and boldness to plead with the world to be reconciled unto you. And Father, we do that on the merits and the basis of what Christ has accomplished. And so we rejoice in that. Uh, we pray that you would uh, bless us as we, as we go forth this week and uh, give us strength and, and courage in our ministry to those around us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.